Thank you. Um, I start with two doors. That's a very typical Maltese scene. Uh, doors make good neighbors, we think. Uh, they're both closed, as you can see. Um, we have no space. We live very close to each other. Um, small places do crazy things. I will share some of the crazy things we've been doing within the context of what the EU, which is where I happen to live in, uh, could do. Uh, note the doors, but also note the letterbox. Um, that's my son uh, 10 years ago. So doors have ways of being penetrated. It's called the little box. Uh, you guys are all into openness. And sometimes I feel when I'm with this gathering of people, we're still always pushing no against this thing of resistance, trying to open doors, maybe. Um, I, I don't know how much you know about the blockchain. Are you guys familiar with blockchain? A few are. Um, are you guys into cryptocurrencies and things like that? I'm not into it. Um, so, so, so I'm going to take a different spin on, on blockchain, okay? But first I want to talk about uh, open education, which it seems to me that has some processes where somehow I can dovetail into blockchain. Um, I, there's input, yeah, open education resources, which is what turns a lot of people on. We now we seem to be moving from OER into open education for various reasons. Uh, the process, open educational processes, and the output is, is, uh, is what? Uh, a piece of paper, a credential, yeah? Credential? Credentials for formal... Uh, education normally, non-formal sometimes, if you're really, you know, uh, cutting edge, professional education, work-based learning, who knows. Uh, there's always a piece of paper which proves to somebody that you know something which other people don't know, don't, don't know about. Uh, it's called your social capital sometimes in life. Um, the, the, I don't know if you can see behind me, um, most of the credentials have something to do with a database. So uh, users store their information somewhere. Um, the institution, of course, which is the uh, power base, um, manages and controls the central database, and parties consult a database. You can all relate to that, isn't it? You know, you go, you slave away, you go and do your PhD at some stage, you wear a funny hat, you go and uh, you have a nice picture, my father picks it, you know, puts it on his, on his door, or no, his, whatever it is he's put it, um, and that's the way it works. Um, the trouble is that a lot of um, traditional institutions, and even uh, you know, new institutions, have certain challenges when it comes to credentials databases. Um, things you can relate to maybe? One, it can be hacked. You know how many people have an MIT Media Lab PhD? Um, ask Philip Schmidt. Uh, he wanted to tell me all about it. Uh, there's a big problem with credentials being hacked. Uh, institutional staff can change grades after the fact. Students can compromise the database, the really wily ones. You know, why go to a whole four years and get yourself into thousands of debt if you can claim to have a PhD. Uh, data can be deleted, disasters, wars. Uh, I live somewhere where we're on the migrant trail. Um, people arrive um, having not drowned on a boat, uh, get to Malta and have to prove that they used to be doctors or plumbers or whatever it is, and they can't prove that they actually um, have the credentials that they once had. The institution might not even exist anymore. Uh, the third one is the institution can prevent access. Students not given access to metrics held on them. What grades did you really get? Transcripts, things like that. You have to pay for transcripts sometimes. When I decided I wanted to do a PhD late in my life, I had to beg ACCA, I used to be a chartered accountant, to tell me what were transcripts were to 20 years before and had to pay good money for it. When I thought, this, these are my credentials, not theirs. Why am I, am I going through all of this process? Institutions can put conditions on access. Um, institutions can use data in an unauthorized way. Um, a journalist wants to know what happened 20 years ago and the institution decides to divulge that information because as far as they're concerned, it belongs to them, but it doesn't belong to me. Um, profiling of students, GDPR, huge big issue right now. Um, and, and, you know, all of this thing is a big problem, really. Uh, credentials, job applications, 30% of people mislead people. Um, most people who are employing people never check CVs. Uh, fake degrees, um, I think it's about 200,000 in the States uh, annually. In terms of 55,000 PhDs have been purchased, especially if you're rich. Um, fraud damage is about 744 million, apparently. So big numbers, yeah. And when it comes to the digital stuff, even you have digital credentials, these two are broken. Um, let's say you're from the Northwestern University, you can you know, have some fancy fonts and prove to people that you studied in the United States. Um, no knowledge on what is inside that credential. It's traditionally just a PDF. Um, it can only be used as intended by the gatekeeper. What are the public benefits? We don't really know that. And again, there's limited access to underli the underlying information, credentials, are not really digital, after all. Did you accumulate a number of credentials? Were they accumulated in ECTSs? Can you then translate them to somebody using them as building blocks for their lifelong learning? 
lack of technical standards for credential information. Ask anybody who's in the QA regime in Europe. Having QA regimes trying to agree with each other as to whether you can get a degree from Maltese that recognized, even if it's under the Bologna Convention, gets to be very interesting. Closed standards, no aggregation of credentials, stuff, that kind of thing. Okay? Um, I can't teach you blockchain. Blockchain is very complicated. So I'm going to try and simplify this um, and stay with me, even if it's boring. Um, it, let's say blockchain is blockchain is really a database shared across a number of participants. It doesn't belong to anyone. All of you could have a part of the blockchain. It's a network of participants where each has a computer. That is important. At any moment in time, simultaneously, each member of the network holds an identical copy of the blockchain database on their computer. Every got a piece, everybody has a piece of the cake. And information is potentially available to all participants at any one moment in time. And the blockchain is now known as a public decentralized ledger. Now, for people like me who hate intermediaries, this is quite cool, actually. I've never had a lot of time for institutions, even though I work for one sometimes. Okay, but decentralization really means that you've got transactions, dates, senders, assets, receivers, and there's something called a hash over there. I won't bother you about the eye test in this one. But let's say the blockchain as a cryptographically secure distributed database ledger. What does it really mean in practice? So I'm going to read this. When data is read or written from the database, the correct cryptographic keys are needed to complete the transaction. A public key, basically the address and the database where information is stored, and you also need a private key, which is your personal key, the security which prevents other people from updating the information unless they have that correct key. Now, if you put that within the context of somebody who has earned a credential, and somebody who is issuing the credential, let's say the public key could be the institution, which is issuing the credential. And then it's up to the learner, the recipient, whether to activate the private key or not. From that moment onwards, if we had to think within the context of education and credentials, power has actually morphed from the education institution into the learner. I'm done, I'm done with the teaching. I now own my credential. It's notarized on the blockchain. It's on my, the wallet, on my phone, it's mine, thank you. It's also a digital log or a digital database of transactions. It's a database that's shared across a private or public network. Still with me? And the process, some funny graphs here, okay? You can't see them from there. Let's just say that the whole notion of credentials on the blockchain at this stage, it's all about the notarizing of a credential on the, on the blockchain. But what it means is storing something called the hash on the distributed ledger. Now, anybody who is into the EU stuff, and I've got two minutes left, and I'm really going to move forward. I won't tell you about hashes, but blockchain address risks by removing the need for a central authority. Each user node stores a complete copy of the database. Each user node has to approve each entry. The version with the most copies is the true version. I'll spare you the eye candy as to how hashes work. <laughs> Off-chain and on-chain. But you need to be careful about something called open, which you would relate to, a blockchain which belongs to everybody, like Bitcoin, and closed blockchains. Note the IBMs, the Microsofts, and everybody else is online to close the blockchain again. Pretty much what happened with the internet. So to recap, social value proposition of the blockchain, these are things you would relate to in terms of your paradigm, openness, open source, open access, open to innovation, open security, no patents, Future-proof, self-sovereign, self-sovereignty and identity, power having passed to the recipient, to the learner. Interoperability, you now have a system which belongs to no one and belongs to everyone. It's decentralized. It works very well in trustless situations where you don't need to rely on one entity or one institution or one software house as to whether something works or doesn't work. It's transparent. You can look at the provenance of how things work. It's all about this intermediation. And the whole immutability process, I can't tell you about this, but trust me, it doesn't break. It won't break because everybody has a copy of that ledger. 
So three immediate applications for the blockchain. We've talked about automatically verifiable secure credentials. We did some project work for the uh, MasterCard Foundation in Toronto. We're looking at reputation systems, for example, young people in Africa who want to prove that they're really good taxi drivers. Can we look at their Uber rankings and somehow use the blockchain to create new systems of accreditation? We should be looking at directories of trusted issuers and time's up. So that was my claim to fame. I wrote a report with Anthony Camilleri on uh, blockchain in education. You can download it. It's been downloaded several thousand times, I understand, over the last uh, months. Um, there are people who are politicians in Malta. All the credentials coming out of the VET University, from the Institute for Tourism Studies, and now from university very soon, all of them are notarized on the blockchain. European Parliament on the 3rd of October, read what it said. It's finally really acknowledging there is a real opportunity for distributed ledger technologies and blockchains. And it's hinting at the need for open source again. So key points, however, we're still at this transition phase. We'll learn a C value on the blockchain. We'll employ a C value. Will open standards become the norm? How quickly can pilots scale up? Does Jacob? He's peering through the letterbox. We're still at that stage, but some countries, the small ones, the crazy ones, are already moving ahead and putting this technology to good use. Thank you.